this countdown we have the man in the iron mask. The man in the iron mask is the name given to an unidentified prisoner arrested in 1669 or 1670. He was imprisoned during the reign of King Louis XIV of France. Now what's so scary about this prisoner is how his identity was always kept unknown. He was forced to wear a mask that blocked off his face. Some say he wore a black velvet mask, while others reported that it was a full on iron mask. Apparently the guards were ordered to shoot this man if he ever removed the mask. On top of that, he was kept in solitary confinement with double doors. He spent the rest of his life there until he died on November 19th, 1703. In our 8th spot we have Ian Manuel. In 1990 when Ian Manuel was only 13 years old, he shot a woman in the face blowing out part of her jaw during a robbery. Thankfully she survived, but as a result of his crime he was tried and convicted as an adult. As a result he was sentenced to 65 years in prison. He was one of the youngest inmates in the Tampa State Penitentiary. Manuel spent 15 plus years in isolation, making him the longest serving inmate in solitary confinement in Florida. Eventually, he was released after the woman he shot actually fought for his freedom, claiming everyone does dumb things when they're young, and she didn't want him to waste his life in jail. In our seventh spot, we have Ian Brady. Between 1963 and 1965, Ian Brady and his accomplice, Richard, and killed five individuals. They would bury their bodies on the moors outside of Manchester, which gave them the name the Moors Murderers. The crimes they committed were horrific, and Brady expressed no remorse. As a result, he was held in solitary confinement. His only contact with the outside world was through letters. It's said that on his free time, he would memorize whole pages of Shakespeare and Plato and then recite them to himself. He would also often interact with television programs. Brady died in prison on May 15, 2017 at the age of 79. Making our way down the list number 6 we have Dennis Ratter. Between the years of 1974 to 1991, American serial killer Dennis Ratter took the lives of 10 individuals. In 2005 he was convicted for his crimes and now he's facing 175 years in solitary confinement without the possibility of parole. Now Dennis likes to go by the name BTK or the BTK Strangler which stands for Bind him, torture him, and kill him. So that says a lot about who this guy is. But thankfully, he is locked away and has no chance of escaping. To this day, Dennis is considered one of the most diabolical serial killers in American history. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with John Massey. In 1975, John Massey got into a fight with a pub's bouncer and he shot him in the chest. At the age of 26, he was sentenced to life for murder. But while in prison, Massey managed to successfully escape three times. His most notorious escape was when he made a makeshift rope out of sheets and a pair of heavy duty gloves to climb over the prison wall. As a result of his escapes, he was placed in solitary confinement. He was allowed 15 minutes outside of his cell each day and had only 8 minutes for a phone call. Other than that, he was kept locked away. He is considered one of Britain's longest serving prisoners. He was eventually released after spending nearly 43 years behind bars. In our fourth spot we have Thomas Silverstein. Thomas Edward Silverstein was an American criminal jailed for armed robbery in 1978. But while in prison, he committed numerous other crimes. In 1983, he killed a prison officer who he stabbed multiple times. Then he murdered two inmates. As a result, he had to be detained in a specially designed cell at the ADX Florence Federal Penitentiary in Colorado. Due to the crimes he committed while in jail, he is considered the most violent prisoner in America. He is also referred to as America's most isolated man. Now, Silverstein was considered so dangerous that he got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There he was confined in a 6 by 7 foot cell. He was constantly under surveillance, in fact the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always keep an eye on him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. He is said to have served the longest term in solitary confinement in the federal penitentiary system. Coming in at number 3 we have Eileen Wernos. Eileen Wernos 
often referred to as the damsel of death, was found guilty of killing seven men. She claimed it was self defense, but then later pleaded guilty to the murders. She would murder them, rob them, and then drive home in their cars. Due to this, she was named America's first female serial killer. Now, Eileen was placed in solitary confinement for quite some time, but then she started to grow paranoid. She thought that the people making her food were spitting in it, and then she also claimed that she was being attacked by a sonic weapon. As a result, she wanted the court to hurry up with her death sentence. On October 9th, 2002, Eileen died by lethal injection. Moving on to number two, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory, otherwise known as the Countess who bathed in blood, was a serial killer killer in Hungary back in the 16th century. It's believed that she had killed around 650 girls. She's also considered the most vicious female serial killer in all recorded history. It's believed that her husband was a big influence in her killings. Apparently, he told her to torture her servants. He said for her to pour honey all over them and then let the bugs eat them. But her killings didn't truly start until she met a witch named Anna Darvula. This witch told Elizabeth that bathing in the blood of the young would help her maintain her youth. And that's exactly what she would do. Eventually, Elizabeth was sentenced to life in solitary confinement. She was locked up in her castle's torture chamber. The windows and doors were boarded up with her inside. There was only a small hole in which food was passed in through. On August 21st, 1611, she passed away. Starting off this countdown, we have Charles Victor Thompson. On April 30th, 1998, Charles Victor Thompson got in an argument with his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend. This argument left them both dead. As a result, he was sentenced to the death penalty. While waiting on death row, Charles actually managed to escape. In 2005, Charles escaped and spent three days on the run until he was found drunk at a payphone. He was then recaptured and placed into solitary confinement, where he waits until the day he receives the death penalty. Moving on at number nine, we have Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson was an English criminal who gained the title the most violent prisoner in Britain and Britain's most notorious prisoner. He was first arrested for armed robbery and served a seven year sentence. Upon his release, he had a career in bare knuckle boxing. Then in 1988, he was convicted of conspiracy to commit another robbery. However, this time when he went back to jail, he became a more violent inmate. In fact, there were multiple times where he took inmates as hostages. He would even often fight guards and fellow prisoners. As a result, he was moved 120 times. That's right, you heard me correctly. Nowadays, he spends his time in solitary confinement, which he will probably remain until his death. In our eighth spot, we have Gary Ridgway. Gary Ridgway, otherwise known as the Green River Killer, was responsible for the murder of 48 women between 1980 and 1990. However, it's believed that he may have killed as many as 71 people. He then would dump the bodies along riverbanks in South King County, giving him the name the Green River Killer. He was arrested arrested in 2001 and given 48 life sentences. Since his conviction, Ridgway has lived in virtual isolation. He was initially going to receive the death penalty, but ended up trading information about his murders to get out of it. But even in solitary confinement, people still considered him a big threat. They feared that he was studying his surroundings and looking for weaknesses, planning to attack or to find a way out. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Richard Lee McNair. Richard Lee McNair received two life sentences after being convicted of murder, attempted murder, and burglary. In 1987, McNair murdered one man and shot a second man four times during a robbery that went wrong. He is currently in ADX Florence in solitary confinement. Now. Here's the thing, Richard managed to escape prison three different times. The first time was in 1988 when he used lip balm as a lubricant to slide his handcuffs off. Then in 1992, he escaped again. And in 2006, he escaped for the last time by mailing himself out of prison. As a result, that's why he was placed into Supermax prison and in solitary confinement. But to this day, he's known as a master escapist. Making our way down the list at number four, we have Robert P. Hansen. 
Robert Hansen was an FBI agent that sold thousands of classified documents to the Soviet and Russian intelligences. These documents outlined US strategies with regards to nuclear wars, exposed developments in the military's weapons, and detailed aspects of US counterintelligence programs. His espionage was considered as possibly the worst intelligence disaster in US history. Robert pleaded guilty to 14 counts of espionage and one conspiracy to commit espionage. As a result, he was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms. He is now serving his time at the ADX Florence, where he is in solitary confinement. Now, the reason why he's in solitary confinement is because he knows way too much about highly classified materials. Therefore, he is locked away to prevent any of this information from getting further leaked. Robert will be in confinement until the day he dies. Coming in at number 3 we have Andre Chikatilo. Andre Chikatilo, otherwise known as the Butcher of Rostov or the Rostov Ripper, was responsible for the deaths of 56 individuals. He would lure people that he met at bus stops or train stations away to remote locations where he would then murder them. He also had cannibalistic tendencies and would eat certain parts of his victims. In 1990, he was finally caught for these heinous crimes. In fact, when he was arrested, he said that he couldn't live without murder. He compared it to a first love, calling it unforgettable. Andre spent two years in solitary confinement awaiting his death penalty in 1994. Coming in at number two, we have Ed Kemper. Ed Kemper, also known as Big Ed, is an American serial killer who killed 10 individuals. It all started back in 1964, when Ed killed his grandparents at the age of 15. He claimed that he killed them just to see what it felt like. As a result, he was locked away for 5 years. In 1969, he was released at the age of 21. But he didn't learn his lesson because he went on to murder eight more individuals, one of them being his own mother. Eventually, he was convicted again and is now placed in solitary confinement. Ed is only allowed an hour of recreation a day and three showers every week. But Ed is apparently okay with this, since he said that he is happier in prison than he ever was as a free man. While in prison, he got the name Big Ed since he weighs around 300 pounds and is 6 foot 9. This dude is massive. I don't know how he fits in that cell. <laughs> Coming in at number 8, we have Zokar Zarnayev. Zokar Zarnayev was sentenced to death in 2015 after he was responsible for the Boston Marathon bombing on April 15, 2013. The bombing resulted in the death of three people and injured around 280 others. He now spends his days in solitary confinement in ADX Florence until he receives his death penalty. But like the guard said, the death penalty is an easy way out of the crimes. Solitary confinement is the real hard punishment. Making our way down the list at number 7, we have Barry Mills. Barry Mills lived a life of crime. He was incarcerated at a young age and from there he grew to be a brutal leader of a prison gang. This gang was huge across prisons. It resulted in numerous prison wars. In fact, he was still actively recruiting members while behind bars. Being placed into solitary confinement couldn't even stop this. Barry was placed into solitary confinement in 2002 after being one of the 40 people charged with committing 32 murders. This gave him the name The Vengeful Killer. Now, Barry is a pretty terrifying looking inmate. He would always wear dark sunglasses because his eye got damaged in a prison fight. Barry spent his time in solitary confinement until 2018 when he passed away. Moving on to number 6 we have Joseph Duncan. Joseph Edward Duncan III was responsible for the kidnapping and deaths of the Grown family. In 2005, Joseph went on a frenzy, stalking the Grown family for days before finally attacking. He killed four out of the five family members. But he is responsible for the death of many others. As a result, he was given the death penalty and is currently living in solitary confinement until the day he dies. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Joseph Lombardo. Joseph Patrick Lombardo, otherwise known as Joey the Clown, was a loan shark, hitman, 
and mobster. This guy had a life of crime. He started off as a jewel thief, then moved on to kidnapping, illegal gambling, and loan sharking. But none of those things got him placed into solitary confinement. In 2009, he was sentenced to life in prison for seven mob murders, along with other crimes. He was serving his sentence at the ADX Florence, where he died at the age of 90. In our third spot, we have Mark David Chapman. I'm sure a lot of you know about him because he is the man who murdered John Lennon. Rest in peace. On December 8th, 1980, Chapman waited outside of Lennon's Manhattan apartment for him to come down. When he did, he shot him four times in the back. Apparently, he did so because of Lennon's immense fame. As a result, he was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. He is currently held in solitary confinement in the Wendy Correctional Facility in upstate New York. The only outside interaction he gets is from his wife once a year and occasional visits from his sister and a few friends. He is part of the family reunion program, so this allows him up to 48 hours alone with his wife in his specially built prison home. That's where he will spend the rest of his life until he dies. In our second spot, we have the Unabomber. The Unabomber is the name given to Ted Kaczynski as he was responsible for numerous mail bombings on innocent people. Apparently, Ted is a very intelligent individual. He skipped sixth grade has an IQ of 167 and went to Harvard. It's a shame that he didn't put his intelligence to good use. Ted was responsible for sending 16 homemade bombs in the mail that killed three individuals and injured 23. As a result, he was charged with three counts of homicide and was sentenced to eight lifetimes in prison. According to another prison inmate, he described Ted as being very weird. Apparently, he won't even go outside when he is allowed to. He spent 24 hours of his day locked away by will. But he was used to it and didn't mind it, since before being placed in solitary confinement, he spent his time in his 12 by 10 foot cabin. Starting off number 10, we have Sam Mendez. Sam Mendez was part of a landmark case decision for minors in solitary confinement that even brought the judge in the case to tears. Mendez was in prison after being convicted of killing a woman at the age of 14, even though no evidence tied him to the crime. At the time he was released, he was in prison for more than 23 years, most of it spent in solitary. He was put in solitary for incredibly small offenses, like making an unpermitted phone call and using a bathroom key when he wasn't supposed to. And literally, I do worse things on the daily. <laughs> but in 2019, his sentence was reconsidered after a 2016 Supreme Court ruling declared life without parole for minors unconstitutional, which gave him the chance for his case to be reconsidered. After he was released, his mother was incredibly relieved, telling news outlets that the last time she had seen him was in 2004. And unfortunately, he left solitary battling a host of mental illnesses. In at number nine, Albert Woodfox. Albert Woodfox was held in solitary for 44 years in a Louisiana prison before being released in 2016, when he was 69 years old. And after being released, he decided to speak out about the torture he had endured while living in isolation, in a book he wrote called Solidarity, My Story of Transformation and Hope. In the book and many interviews he did after, he spoke of how the hardest day was when he learned he wouldn't be able to attend his mother's funeral. In the book, he speaks of the severe bouts of claustrophobia he would endure, saying, quote, the pain was so intense, it was so deep, I had never felt that kind of pain before. This was different from physical pain. My very soul ached, he said in an interview with The Current. In 1971, age 22, he was convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to 50 years in Angola prison, which is known for being one of the hardest prisons in America. Then in 1973, he was sent to solidarity after being convicted for the murder of a prison guard. But in the book and in the interviews that followed, he maintained his innocence, saying that when the prison guard was found dead, him and another inmate were convicted, despite no physical evidence against them, with Woodfox believing his conviction was because he was a member of the Black Panthers and was trying to fix the prison system while he was inside. Up at number 8, Frank De Palma. Frank De Palma developed agoraphobia while he was in solitary confinement, which is a fear of going outside, and a preference for being locked in his tiny cell. After he was sentenced to prison for grand larceny, battery, second degree murder, and attempted murder, he was sentenced to solitary when some new and young gang members were brought into the prison in an effort to separate them. And for the last five years of his sentence, he never once came out of his cell, saying in an interview that he would cherish the times when he would get to go outside to exercise. But one day he felt intense anxiety about being outside, and it didn't stop until he was back in his cell, saying that eventually just the thought of coming out of his cell for any reason 
would send him into a panic. And after that, he was sent to the psych ward for 10 months because he had developed a serious mental illness. And he still struggles even though he has been released from prison. In at number seven, Steven Slevin. Steven Slevin was thrown in jail in 2005 after he got a DWI, then spent two years in solitary confinement. But after his terrible treatment while inside, he was actually awarded $15.5 million in one of the largest prisoner civil rights awards in US history. After Slevin was put in prison, he was almost immediately put in solitary, and there were months where he did not leave. He was given food and medication during these periods but wasn't bathing, resulting in mold forming on his skin and his teeth to rot. Ugh, I'm not gonna lie, I kinda got chills saying that one, like how can someone develop mold, like that's just so messed up. Then after he was released, he started a case for prisoner rights because of all the atrocities he had faced while inside. His lawyer spoke more about the case, saying they were able to prove that the prison was completely indifferent to the terrible conditions he faced. And with all the evidence they had against the prison, Slevin was awarded $22 million by a jury. But after some appeals, it was settled at $15.5 million. In at number six, Adam Capay. Adam Capay is a First Nations man that was sent to solitary confinement in 2012 after he was charged with killing another inmate. But there were many cries for his release after he was subjected to four years in isolation, as well as 24 7 artificial light. With the minister in charge of Ontario Prison stating that back in 2016, he would not release him from solitary as that was the decision for the courts, not a politician. While awaiting trial, Capay served approximately four and a half years in solitary confinement. And during his isolation, his lawyers argued these conditions constituted cruel and unusual punishment. The courts ended up agreeing, with a judge ruling that the violation of Capay's rights under the Canadian Charters of Rights and Freedoms outweighed the government charges. Capay was then released in January 29th, 2019. Halfway through at number five, Caesar Villa. Caesar Villa spoke about his awful time while in solitary in an essay he wrote back in 2013, while he was in his 12th year of isolation at the Pelican Bay Security Housing Unit, or SHU. Villa was originally placed in solitary indefinitely after being validated as a gang member. In an essay, he wrote how being in the SHU was a cold and empty world, where the emptiness would seep into your bones, saying in the first few weeks he tried to tell himself that he could get through it. But then as the weeks went on, things got worse. He was forced to sit outside in the cold during his time in solitary, and he would stand in his underwear in the yard while he was shivering from the rain and snow coming down on him, saying that at the end of his first year, his feet and hands began to split open from the cold, and that he bled all over his clothes, food, and even in his sheets. Even saying that the facility was so strict, band-aids weren't even allowed saying that he didn't realize it then, but in hindsight, his psyche was unraveling. And oh my god, after hearing that, that honestly might be the worst one. Oh, that is just crazy. Then in at number four, Sarah Jo Pender. Even though most people that end up in solitary are men, women are not immune from this treatment. Some are even sent to solitary as a retaliation for them exposing a inside the prison from staff. Sarah Jo Pender was sent to prison after being convicted of murder along with her boyfriend, but later was sent to solitary confinement after she escaped from prison in 2008, leading to her being featured on America's Most Wanted. After many years in solitary, she decided to write about her time while there, with her writing about how women would come in sane, but would leave completely shut down inside, or hurting themselves out of frustration, saying how she witnessed her prison mates making countless attempts on their own lives, with items they found around the prison. A book on her escape called Girl Wanted, The Chase for Sarah Pender was released back in 2011, but it was criticized for being pretty inaccurate. In at number three, Ashley Smith who unfortunately ended up passing away after she strangled herself in 2007. And a jury ended up deciding the fact that it was not a suicide, but rather a homicide, because of how neglected Smith was. And even more horribly, the prison guards witnessed the horrific event, with some even videotaping it, if you can believe it, because they were ordered to not go inside of her cell if she's still breathing, even though they could pretty clearly see what was gonna happen if they didn't intervene. Two years later, one of newly elected Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's first acts was to ask Cabinet to implement recommendations arising from the inquest into her treatment. With Smith's mother, Coralie, writing in the Globe and Mail in 2014 that her daughter's death would not be the last time solitary confinement would put Canadian inmates in harm's way, and that more needed to be done to stop all this. And at number two, Reddit AMA. To spice up the list a bit, I wanted to include a Reddit AMA, where an anonymous user wrote that they were in solitary for 15 years, and said they would answer questions, with the user revealing that they were in prison because they tried to kill their stepfather, but they were put in solitary solitary because of a gang affiliation, saying that after being released, they were able to lead somewhat of a normal life, with them now being employed as a taxi driver, but that they still struggle with PTSD from the experience and have a tendency to push others away to this day. And if you were wondering what can be done while you're in solitary,
solitary, they spoke of how they tried to keep their mind active by reading, writing, and listening to the radio. But since they were restricted for the most part while inside, meaning they were only able to read law books and a bible. Then ending off saying that the silence of lockdown is mind numbing and suffocating, and with the only noises being heard is screaming, crying, or banging on cell doors. It drove them mentally insane. Then at number 1, Keith Lamar. Keith Lamar was locked up after he killed someone as a teenager in a dispute over drugs. A few years after, he was placed in solitary and then sentenced to death after he was convicted of killing 5 other inmates during the Lucasville uprising. He then spent 27 years in solitary confinement in a supermax prison in Ohio, isolated for 23 hours a day in a bathroom sized room. And in all those years, he was not let outside whatsoever, and his only connection to the outside was a crack in the wall. But he is trying to change the rules in prison, as after a hunger strike in 2011 by him and some other inmates, him and others in the Ohio prison won the right to hug their family members during visits, instead of just seeing them through plexiglass, as well as being able to make phone calls. In light of the current pandemic, Lamar has been asked advice from his friends and family on how to cope with quarantine, with him telling Mother Jones that he's lucky to have a full bookshelf and a desk, but he also takes time to look inside himself by painting and doing yoga and meditations. Number 9, Not Everyone's a Monster Alright, let's continue on this list of the dark solitary confinement stories, and at number 9 we have Not Everyone's a Monster. Their perspective on the other side can let us know that not even the guards like what's happening in these prisons. A corrections officer posted on Reddit about how watching inmates get forced into solitary confinement was the worst part of his job. You could see people break and it was disgusting to see. The corrections officers didn't want to see the inmates hurt or tormented. They just wanted to come in and do their job and just leave without being harmed or seeing the inmates and convicts harmed. This reddit poster talked about a particular incident where a warden forced someone to stay in solitary confinement for a minor offense. They were shoved into a room that had no bed and there was literally just a shower. They stayed there for three days and started to self harm because they just couldn't take it. They were going crazy. The person was removed and afterwards the warden was fired. Number 7, Reddit Confession. Reddit user Jesus broke down what their experience in solitary confinement was. About how they felt as if they're going insane from being forced to stay in the same cell for who knows how long. The lights in the cell were kept on all the time. There was never an escape from the glow shining down on him, confusing his mind to what day it was. Because he doesn't know when it's nighttime. It's always daytime for him. It's always the same day for him. Thankfully, our Reddit user had a bulletproof window that he can look outside if he stood on his toes. So he needs to go up there, which means, you know, that's the only time he can actually see out. This was his only connection with the outside world. It's pretty sad if you asked me. And moving right along, just like that, at number six, we have agrophobia. Phobia. I didn't even know that this was a thing. I mean, I don't know about a lot of these phobias that I've been reading about. Well, this article that I was reading is from the Marshall Project. It's an interview with a prisoner who was in solitary confinement for 22 years. Agoraphobia is basically the opposite of claustrophobia, when people must be in smaller spaces or they start to have panic attacks. The prisoner said that the last five years of his time in solitary confinement, he didn't leave his cell, like, at all. Could you guys imagine that? I, I can't imagine that at all. When he was first locked away in solitary, he would leave his cell to go to the yard and exercise, but one day that all changed. He stepped out and it felt like the air around him was just crushing him, like his heart was going to explode. He smashed on the door until they opened it, and when the door opened, he wasn't running out of his cell, he was running in his cell. The guards would sometimes use this to aggravate him, they would threaten to pull him out, out of his cell. I mean, this is really sad. Is this real life right now? This shouldn't be a fear to be outside of your cell. This guy just can't handle freedom at all. He would lay in his cell and make up an imaginary life for himself. He would picture himself going on dates, getting married, raising children, an entire fantasy life all inside of his mind. Something to provide him with joy while being too afraid to leave the box. Number five. I probably did like 17 years, 18 years in segregation. Um, and I did long stretches. It was short times, but the longest one was 10 years. Well, that, that was Danny, aka Beast. Two separate prison sentences, a 24 and a 16 split. First locked up in 1977, he spent 10 straight years in solitary, but that wasn't the only time. He was in and out of segregation throughout the entirety of his two prison sentences. He is one of the lucky ones who got out and back into society, and now he's partnered with a YouTube channel, After Prison, where his life showcased and dissected his regard to his haunting experiences. I was having trouble mentally in dealing 
with segregation for so long. So in a number two, we have another dark story told. This story said, I've been on a roller coaster up and down. I really had some bad times, some bad thoughts. You just start thinking along lines of maybe this is it. Maybe this is how I'm going to end. Suicide is probably one of the main things down here. And he also said, I'm pretty much going through that. I was going to end my life. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can stay down here in the hole that long. Well, this was a direct quote from Richard Wolf, a man who experienced 640 days in solitary confinement. His brother is shown holding a photo of Richard who died in prison when he collapsed in the exercise yard. And this is during the one hour a day he was allowed outside due to underlining heart conditions that were never met with appropriate medical attention. Starting us off at number 10, James Richardson. Back in 1967, this man was wrongfully convicted for poisoning and killing seven of his young family members. The day the crime took place, the babysitter named Bessie Reese had been watching them and despite her being home with them at the time of the killings and being a convicted killer on parole for taking her ex-husband's life, Richardson was still blamed. During his trial, it became very clear that the jury, as well as the local law enforcement, were not treating him fairly. Richardson would tell his lawyer about one of the officers on the case routinely calling him slurs and being cruel during questioning. Richardson claims he was often told just to admit he was guilty to get a shorter sentence, but he refused to admit to something he didn't do. During trial, it was revealed that the night before the incident, he had been looking into life life insurance policies and that mixed with the fact that he was a black man in 1967 with an all white jury was enough for them to think he was guilty. Richardson was initially sentenced with the death penalty but 21 years later after a new look into the case it was revealed it had been an extremely unfair trial and that no proper investigations were done. Richardson was clearly innocent and it had been the babysitter all along. Now out and free as he always should have been he will be rewarded $50,000 for each year of his wrongful imprisonment. Next up at number 9, Sunny Jacobs. In 1976, while driving with her young kids, both Sunny and her husband, Jesse Tafaro, were arrested after they were believed to be responsible for killing a police officer along with a friend, Walter Rhodes. Now, Rhodes had been the only one who tested positive for gunpowder residue, but after he agreed to testify against Sunny and Jesse so that he could receive a lighter sentence instead of the death penalty, he threw his dear friends under the bus. Both Sunny and Jesse were sentenced to death and Jacob spent the next five years in solitary confinement away from her entire family and the life she knew. She was adamant to remain as positive as she could and would practice yoga every day, reminding herself that if people survived World War II camps, that she could surely survive this. In 1981, the Supreme Court adjusted Sunny's sentence to life after it was uncovered that Rhodes lied and that it was he and not the couple who had pulled the trigger. But sadly, Jesse received received no such deal and was still sentenced to the electric chair in 1990, which made headlines as the chair caught on fire during the execution and he suffered a long 13 minute demise. In 1992, enough evidence was brought forward to overturn Sunny's conviction and 16 years after being arrested, she was finally set free. Sadly, she had to go into this new world without her husband and a practical stranger to her family, but after some time, she reconnected with her loved ones and now lives a happy life. Next up at number 8, David Ranta. In 1990, there was a tragic case where a criminal tried to rob a jewelry courier before hitting him with a car. Upon fleeing the scene, the perp also shot and killed a rabbi who had been a survivor of a World War II camp, then stole his car and drove off. The public was up in arms, understandably, about the entire ordeal and wanted answers fast. In came the controlled choice of David Ranta, who was sentenced to 37 years for a crime he was innocent of. Now, investigators insist that they never set out to frame anyone for the killing, but the optics are not good. First, Ranta always denied having any involvement in the case. And while, of course, that isn't something that you can trust as a judge, Ranta was tricked into signing a confession by investigators, and it was revealed later that much of the paperwork was missing. Further, a witness came forward in 2011 claiming that they had been coached into choosing him from a lineup. And despite the fact that he was only chosen in one of the five lineups and that the courier insisted it was not Ranta who had tried to rob him, they still found him guilty. 
Thankfully, after serving 23 years, the case was reviewed and a judge confirmed it had been an unfair trial, clearly with some underlying motive. She apologized for him being put away as an innocent man, and Ranta will receive $6.4 million for his wrongful conviction. Coming in at number 7, Reuben Carter. While Reuben Carter grew up to be a good, innocent man, he had a troubled childhood that led him into some bad crowds. In 1948, he was sentenced to a juvie center for assault after stabbing someone that he claimed was trying to commit SA. Then in 1954, he left the center and joined the army, but after two years, he was discharged after being declared unfit for service and sent back to the states, where shortly after, he went to prison for two separate muggings. But after his release in 1961, he wanted to turn his life around. Having found an interest in the army, he became a professional boxer and got his nickname the Hurricane. He in fact had a really lucrative career and by 1965 was rated the top 5 fighter in middleweight. But sadly, one night would take it all away. In 1966, two black men entered a bar and shot and killed three people. Ten minutes after the incident, police stopped a rental car being driven by John Artis, and Carter was in the back seat with another friend. But despite witnesses saying that the getaway car had just two black men both sitting in the front seat, evidence was muddled and the two were still arrested. Carter and Artis were both sentenced to life in prison, and even after a retrial the year after their sentences remained upheld. Eventually, after 19 years behind bars, a judge overturned his conviction and Carter moved to Toronto and became an activist for those who had been wrongfully convicted. Bob Dylan even wrote a song called Hurricane after him. Next up at number 6, William Dylan. In 1981, a man was brutally beaten to death in a wooded area near Canova Beach in Florida. Later that morning, a man wearing a t-shirt covered in blood was seen hitchhiking by the woods and when he was picked up, he asked to be driven to a nearby tavern. Meanwhile, Dylan was miles away from the entire thing. Still, he got entangled in the case and became the prime suspect after a scent tracking dog linked Dylan to the t-shirt after it was found in the trash. During trial, Dylan's ex-girlfriend testified against him saying that she had been with him on the night of the crime and had seen him standing over the body. Then the driver, who was legally blind in one eye, identified Dylan as the hitchhiker despite previous descriptions not not remotely matching Dylan's appearance. Dylan maintained his innocence, but still, five days later, he was sentenced to life in prison. Then, less than two weeks after the trial, his ex girlfriend recanted her testimony. She said she had made up the whole story after officers had threatened her with 25 years in prison if she didn't testify. And to make matters worse, it was discovered that she and the lead officer had an intimate relation during the investigation. After 23 years behind bars, Dylan was finally exonerated after a DNA test proved he had no link to the crimes, and in 2012, Dylan received $1.3 million in compensation. Coming in at number 5, Dewey Bazella. In his early years, Bazella witnessed and suffered a lot of abuse at the hands of his father. Tragically, he even witnessed his own mother's death, who was killed by his father. In his youth, he was sent to live in a group home, but started getting into trouble and mixing with a bad crowd. Eventually, he found boxing, and it seemed like maybe his life was going to turn around. But in 1983, his life was stolen from him after he was arrested and convicted for killing a 92 year old woman that police believed he shot after trying to rob her house. Bazella never once strayed from protesting his innocence, even after four parole hearings that all claimed admittance of guilt could help him. But he had a different plan. Behind bars, Bazella decided to study the legal system and became a certified paralegal to prove his innocence once and for all. Finally, he was able to reach out to the Innocence Project who referred him to a new lawyer. His new representation discovered that evidence had been suppressed by prosecutors during the initial trial that in fact proved his innocence and proved he had been framed. In 2009, after serving 26 years, he was finally set free and in 2011, his dreams came true and he finally had his first professional boxing match. Next up at number 4, James Bain. In 1974, a young 
kidnapped from his home before being dragged into a baseball field and brutally taken advantage of by a man the boy described as having bushy sideburns and a mustache. A relative of the victim thought the description sounded like James Bain, and when the victim was given five photos of potential attackers, he chose the photo of Bain. At the time of his arrest, Bain had no previous criminal record and insisted that he was at home with his sister at the time of the attack, but still the trial went forward. According to the FBI, the assailant left semen on the victim's underwear, but sadly at the time of the trial, DNA testing was not available. What they did instead was test his blood group. The perp was from blood group B, and despite Bain being group AB, which should have excluded him, the analyst claimed he had a weak A, and therefore was still a viable option. This was disproved by another expert who said that Bain actually had a really strong A and should have therefore been excluded. But wanting to put someone behind bars for the crime, Bain was sentenced to life. In 2001, Bain started petitioning to get DNA testing done, and thank by 2005, after being picked up by the Innocence Project, his wish was granted. By 2009, the DNA showed definitively that there was no match between Bain and the perp, so after 35 long years in prison, he was finally set free with a $1.75 million compensation for his wrongful conviction. Next up at number 3, Louis Taylor. At just 16, Louis Taylor was accused of setting fire to an Arizona hotel that ended up killing 28 people back in 1970. From the get-go, Taylor Taylor was adamant about his innocence, but since he was nearby the incident when it happened, and he was dealing with racist officers who quite literally said that black boys like to set fires and used that as grounds in court, he was convicted for arson and sentenced to 28 consecutive life sentences. The saddest part is that not only was Taylor innocent, but he was only near the fire as he was actually trying to help people escape from the burning building. But happened to have matches in his pocket upon the arrest, so police just assumed it was him. 42 years later, it was uncovered the fire may have actually not even been caused intentionally, and it certainly wasn't caused by Taylor. Although free, Taylor's case doesn't have quite the same happy ending, as he received no compensation for the 42 years away based on a technicality of his plea deal. Coming in at number 2, Michael Morton. In 1986, Morton lived a normal life. He had a wife and a family, a normal car, and everything short of the picket fence. But after his wife was bludgeoned to death in the couple's bed, he became the prime suspect, and his life was anything from normal ever again. The day after Christine's body was found, police discovered a post-it on the mirror with a cheeky note about his disappointment of not being intimate the night prior. But the note didn't have any kind of dark tone, and it even ended in saying, I love you. Morton Morton's son had actually been home at the time of the attack, and he insisted on his father's innocence, saying daddy was not home, it was a monster who did it. There was tons of evidence pointing towards a different perp, like Christine's missing credit cards being found with strange charges, and neighbors witnessing a green van beside the house and a strange man walking off into a nearby wooded area. But evidence concerning the son's eyewitness account, the green van, and Christine's credit cards were all absolutely absent from the records given to the judge. The prosecution presented no witnesses or evidence that tied Morton to the crime, but they deduced that he had killed Christine because she refused to sleep with him the night prior to her death. So on February 17, 1987, Michael Morton was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. In 2005, the Innocence Project got involved, and after finally getting clearance to run testing in 2011, they discovered an already convicted felon had been responsible all along, and Morton was finally released after 25 years. Last up today in our number one spot, we have Richard Phillips. Phillips grew up in an unfortunately poor and crime filled area of Detroit. His whole life he suffered unending abuse from his stepfather, and he often would try to run away from home, but was always brought back by the police. In his teens, he became friends with a guy named Fred Mitchell, and the two started skipping school, messing around with BB guns, and just overall getting into trouble. But Phillips decided to take a different path in life, and as he got older, he got 
got a good job, met a girl, they started a family together. Life was good until 1971 when he got fired from his job after he was falsely accused of burning someone with a cigarette. At this same time, his old friend Mitchell was on parole and brought with him a new friend from prison. Dago. Phillips got mixed up with him and started to fall into old habits, turning to a secret life of substance abuse. Then one night after two men committed an armed robbery at a convenience store, his life changed forever. They knew it was a white man and a black man, and Dago was already confirmed in the crime, but there was debate if the second robber was Phillips or Mitchell. After a lineup, witnesses confirmed it was Phillips, and shortly after he was sentenced to life in prison. After a very long long 46 years behind bars, Dago finally admitted that Mitchell had been his accomplice and that he hadn't even met Phillips until eight days after the crime had happened. Phillips finally walked free after a near half century in prison. Mm -hmm.